Greetings and welcome to this third Sunday of Advent. I'm Pastor Bob Klein and we are so glad that you're joining us for virtual worship with Trinity and Fort Yuma United Methodist Churches. This third week of Advent has us lighting the candle of joy. As we continue our series on those who dream, we continue our journey in the mystery and awe of God's dreams and pray that they shape our reality. There are several announcements that I would like to make today. First, as you may have noticed, we've added a wreath to our sanctuary decorations. This wreath is in remembrance of all of our veterans. For the past couple of years, Trinity has participated in the Wreaths Across America program, which places wreaths on the graves of veterans in our local cemeteries. We also place wreaths on the niches of veterans in our columbarium in the Barnes Chapel here at the church. We thought that it was only fitting that we should also honor our veterans here in the sanctuary. Thanks to Marilyn Young and Pam Young Walker for providing the wreath. If you have driven by the church at night, you might have noticed that our angel trees are up in the narthex and are illuminated each evening from 6 to 11 p.m. Our hope and prayer is that the angel trees are a beacon of hope for all who see the love of Christ, just as the gifts that you generously provided for the children whose parents are incarcerated are symbols of Christian love. On Friday, December 4th, we collected and dropped off over 585 pounds of food to the Yuma Community Food Bank, along with a cash donation of $750. We appreciate your contributions through our reverse Advent food drive. There will be one additional drive-by drop-off day on Friday, December 18th from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. in the back parking lot at the church. The food bank reports that they have gone from distributing about 300 food bags a day to the current level of over 1,000 bags per day. Our donations are critical as we seek to feed those in the Yuma community. Please check your pantry or make an extra stop at the store and pick up non-perishable food for donation. Or you can make a monetary donation through the church to the food bank. On Christmas Eve, we will be placing luminaries around the church as we celebrate Christ's birth. Team Trinity will be coordinating our efforts to raise funds for the American Cancer Society. You may submit names in honor or memory of individuals to be placed on the luminaries. We are asking for a donation of $5 per luminary. Names may be sent to Marilyn Young and the money to the church designated for luminaries. On Christmas Eve from 5.30 to 7.30, the bags will be placed around the church and you are invited to drive by. If you are not receiving our regular electronic updates, you may sign up on our website at trinityyuma.org. Scroll down to the weekly update and prayer list sign-up section, enter the information, and you will begin receiving our updates. Remembering that our church office remains closed except by appointment, but our phones are answered remotely Monday through Thursday from 9 a.m. to 12 noon, and your emails will be answered as soon as possible. Let us now center our hearts and minds and come together in singing our opening hymn, Christ is the World's Light. Yes. Mm-hmm. 
Once upon a time, there was a little girl who had a terrible day. She left her lunch at home, she skinned her knee on the playground, and no one wanted to sit with her on the bus. As she sank into her mother's arm at the end of the day, her mother said, Honey, what was the best part of your day? The little girl cried and said, Nothing! The entire day was terrible! So the mother got down on one knee, wiped away her tears, and said, There is always some good. Sometimes we just really have to look for it. The little girl looked up at her mom and said, What is good about today? And her mother said, for starters, you're in my arms. Friends, anytime we gather together to worship God, we are here in God's arms. So may we recognize that gift, and in doing so, may we sow joy. Let, Let us, us worship, worship holy, holy God. God. I dream of dance parties in the kitchen. I dream of laughter that is contagious. I dream of birthday candles and another beautiful year. I dream of family game nights and dinner with friends. I dream of homemade Halloween costumes and homemade family recipes. I dream of pillow forts, fireflies, and front porch swings. I dream of every little thing that brings joy, and I know it comes from God. Today, we relight the candle of hope. And the candle of peace. Today, we light the candle of joy as a reminder that God's dream for this world involves the end of all tears. God's dream for this world involves a joy that overflows and is contagious. So may this fire burn bright, and as it does, may we sing. May we dance. May we laugh. May we hold on to the people we love. May we sow joy in a hurting world, and may it be an act of holy resistance. Amen. Amen. O great, o great writer, with a sky full of stars and a world full of flowers, there should be no end to my joy. And yet, instead of decorating my very being with joy, I let it slip away like loose change. Instead of singing like Mary or dancing like David, I pass by remarkable beauty and love most days, unfazed. Forgive me. Teach me the ways of children who laugh and dance and sing as if joy is the very thing that keeps them alive. Maybe they have joy figured out. Gratefully, Gratefully we, we pray. pray. Amen. Amen. Hear these words from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 6 through 8 and 19 through 28. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. This is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. 
Are you the prophet? He answered, No. Then they said to him, Who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, Why then are you baptizing as if you are neither the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. This took place in Bethany across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The, the word, word of, of God, God for the, for the people, people of God. God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Will you join me now in our prayer for illumination? Creator God, Scripture is flooded with dreamlike images. The lion lying down with the lamb, justice rolling like a mighty river, swords being beaten into plowshares, the prisoner being set free, good news to the oppressed, the whole world rejoicing. To our human ears, there are times when these words can sound like nothing more than a far-off dream downplaying prophecy to fantasy. However, what we know is that to dream is to hope, and to hope is to imagine, and to imagine is to wander, and to wander is to believe, and to believe is to live and breathe for your promised day. So give us the strength to listen as we dream, O God, for deep down we know your words are the very thing we need. Amen. I wonder if you have ever given any thought to the extent of the preparations involved when the President of the United States makes a visit to a local community. A former agent with the FBI tells about some of those preparations. A team of Secret Service personnel checks out every building along the route he will travel and every place where he, where he will be appearing, he says. They go over each building with a fine-tooth comb from roof to basement in their efforts to prepare for his safety. We often refer to people like this as an advanced team. They work invisibly behind the scenes to make sure that everything is ready for the big event that is about to take place. Advanced people or advanced teams are, are very important to any well-known person who moves from town to town. Jesus had an advanced man. Someone who was in charge of preparing the way for his coming. The advanced man, of course, was John the Baptist. John wasn't hired by Jesus for this task. The prophet Isaiah assigned him the task 400 years before. As we saw last week, the prophet Isaiah foretold John's coming. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God, wrote Isaiah. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The appearance of John the Baptist in the wilderness was the most important event in the life of Israel for more than 400 years. It had been that long since a prophet of God had lifted his voice to proclaim the word of the Lord. Probably you or I would never have been drawn to the preaching of John the Baptist. A man clothed in camel hair and wild animal skins and subsisting on a diet of locusts and wild honey, living out in the wilderness would not seem to have much to say about the way we live our lives today. His appearance was eccentric. His preaching was morbid, all about sin and repentance calling people snakes and warning them of the wrath that was to come. We like our sins treated more gently. Preferably, we would really like them not mentioned at all. From his birth, says Dr. Fred Craddock, John was set aside as a Nazarite. A Nazarite was a person who was devoted to God and therefore lived away from society. 
A Nazarite did not trim the beard, did not cut the hair, lived in an unusual way. Two things may surprise us then about John the Baptist. One is how popular John was. The other is his role in the drama of the first Christmas. As to his popularity, Mark tells us that the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. That was quite an amazing response to his, will, this wilderness preacher. Can you imagine every single person in a large metropolitan area in all of the surrounding countryside repenting of their sins and being baptized in a river? Over the years, there have been many outstanding preachers, but none as effective as John the Baptist. In Belfast, Ireland in the 1920s, there was a very well-known but somewhat strange preacher named William Nicholson, whose ministry bore a resemblance to John's ministry. Nicholson did things most preachers would never do. For example, he would call out people from the pulpit on their oddities and their manner of dress. In other words, he kind of told it like it was. And people seemed to love hearing him preach. They seemed to love being roasted from the pulpit. Nicknamed the tornado of the pulpit, Nicholson aimed his ministry at men, particularly men who worked in the shipyards. It is said that his straightforward language communicated to the common man. Nicholson would go to the massive shipyards in Belfast at lunchtime. He would conduct Bible studies and preach to the men during their lunch breaks. Thousands of people claimed to have been converted under his ministry. And such was a sense of repentance that came upon the shipyard workers from his preaching that things that they had borrowed from the company and taken home, bits of equipment, inventory tools, that kind of thing, well, they were all being returned. In the Belfast shipyard, a shed named the Nicholson Shed was erected to house stolen tools that newly converted workers were returning as a result of Nicholson's preaching. In fact, they had to rent a building in town in order to store all of the stuff. People were under conviction of sin. That seems to be the kind of preacher that John the Baptist was. But there was one fact that set John the Baptist apart from all other preachers. Among those who came to John to be baptized was a young carpenter, in fact a cousin of John the Baptist, named Jesus of Nazareth. But we are getting ahead of our story here. Today we want to know about John's role in the first Christmas. Luke begins his version of the Christmas story not with Mary and Joseph, but with a couple named Zacharias and Elizabeth. Zacharias was a priest. He and Elizabeth were deeply religious people who did their best to keep all of God's commandments. Late in life, they were childless, much to their sorrow. One day, while Zacharias was going about his priestly functions in the temple, he was startled by the appearance of an angel. It was our old friend Gabriel. Do not be afraid, Zacharias, said Gabriel. Your prayers have been heard. Elizabeth, your wife, will bear you a son. And you are to call him John. Zacharias was really knocked off, nearly knocked off his feet. How can I know this to be true, he asked. I'm an old man myself and, and my wife is getting on in her years. I am Gabriel, the angel answered. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to you and to tell you the good news. As a sign to Zacharias that his message was true, he was literally struck speechless which is how you or I would probably feel under the circumstances. When the new infant was born, there was much joy in the home of Zacharias and Elizabeth. On the day, eighth day, they took him to be circumcised. It was a custom to give the child its name at the rite of circumcision. Family and friends thought that the infant boy would be named Zacharias after his father. But Elizabeth spoke up and said, Oh no, his name is John. But none of your relatives is called John, they replied. And they made a sign to the poor mute Zacharias to see what name he wanted the child to have. Zacharias beckoned for a writing tablet and wrote the words, His name is John. At this moment, Zacharias' speech was restored, and his first words were to thank God. 
the neighbors were awestruck, and news of these events spread throughout Judea. People asked, what is this child's future going to be? For as Luke says, the Lord's blessing was plainly upon him. It was six months after Gabriel had given the joyous news to Zacharias that he would father a son that Gabriel also appeared to a young woman in Nazareth named Mary. Gabriel's message to Mary was that that she was to bear a son, but not just any son. He would be the son of the Most High God, and his name would be Jesus. Now, Mary was a cousin of Elizabeth, and they must have been very close, for Mary spent three months of her pregnancy living with Zacharias and Elizabeth. Indeed, Elizabeth was the first person in the Scriptures to declare that Jesus is Lord. You will find the story in the first chapter of Luke. As you are aware, we know very little about Jesus' childhood. However, in view of Mary and Elizabeth's close relationship, can we not speculate that young John and his six-month younger cousin Jesus spent a great deal of time together? Perhaps they played together and fished together and, and did all the things that young men like to do. Might this not explain the kind of man John the Baptist became? He was in intimate contact with Jesus. Cousins can certainly have that kind of influence on each other. Might this also not explain John the Baptist's reaction when he saw Jesus come out with the others to be baptized? Matthew tells us that John was reluctant to baptize his younger cousin. I need you to baptize me, John protested. This says something special to me about Jesus' character as a youth and young adult. The Jewish historian Josephs affirms that John the Baptist's ministry was a stunning success. Untold numbers of people from all over the area came to be baptized by him in the River Jordan. Many of those who were baptized became his disciples. They studied with John and sought to follow him as others later were to follow Jesus. Indeed, two of Jesus' most prominent disciples, Andrew and John, were originally followers of John the Baptist. You will remember that one of the most gifted and influential preachers mentioned in the book of Acts was a man named Apollos, who, according to Acts 18.25, was originally baptized as a disciple of John. Yet consider the humility of this man, John. I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This says a lot about Jesus, if John was unfit to untie his sandals. But it also says much about John. He was a man of great humility. New Testament scholar Don Jewell once pointed out that in this chapter, John the Baptist becomes the man who is not. When the priests and Levites ask him who he is, he replies that he is not the light. He is not the Christ. He is not Elijah. He is not the final prophet. Then he adds, he is not worthy to untie the true one's sandals. He is not the one to baptize with the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist has kind of a reverse resume, says Jewel. Typically on a resume you list all the things that you are, all the things you have done and what you've accomplished. But John had a resume that was like a photographic negative. Before he could say who he was and what he had come to do, he had to go on and on to say who he was not and what his work would not be about. In spite of his own popularity, John sought to direct attention not to himself, but to Jesus. That kind of humility is a rare commodity even today. It was not his intent to draw attention to himself. His greatest desire was to glorify Jesus. The great composer and conductor Leonard Bernstein once said that the hardest instrument to play is second fiddle. John willingly took on the part of second fiddle. John was a humble man, but he was also a man 
of enormous courage. The ending to John's life was tragic, as you know. He offended the royal family of his day by confronting them with their sins, and for his efforts, he was beheaded. John the Baptist was a preacher of righteousness, and he would not betray his convictions. The world has always been made better by men and women of such character. Some of you will remember a young Wall Street Journal reporter named Daniel Pearl. A man of Jewish faith, Pearl was working at the time as a South Asia bureau chief of the Wall Street Journal. He was based in Mumbai, India. He and his wife, Marianne, had not been married long, and she was expecting their first baby. And then in 2002, a great tragedy occurred in their lives. Pearl was kidnapped when he went to Pakistan as part of an investigation into the alleged links between British citizen Richard Reed, known as the Shoe Bomber, and Al-Qaeda. You remember what happened to him. He was decapitated like John the Baptist. His captors filmed the execution and they released it on video, circulating it online for all the world to see. Daniel Pearl paid the ultimate price for his commitment to his country. John the Baptist paid the ultimate price for his commitment to God. John was a man of humility and courage. Just as impressive, however, was his determination to bear witness to the light. John bore witness to the light in his preaching. He bore witness in his life. On the banks of the Jordan, he proclaimed that the kingdom of God was at hand. When he saw Jesus, he declared, Behold, the Lamb of God. He was the ultimate advance man. He prepared the way for the coming Messiah. So as you celebrate this Christmas season, as you think about the shepherds and the wise men and the star and Mary and Joseph and all of the rest of the important figures and events of the first Christmas, give a little thought to another small child born six months before Christ, to a deeply devout couple named Zacharias and Elizabeth. Their son was not the Messiah. He simply bore witness to the Messiah. There was no star shining over the house where he lay, just a mute old man beaming down at him with pride and great joy. It was the joy of one who had lived to see the promises of God fulfilled. It was plain at John's birth, according to Luke, that the Lord's blessing was upon him, and it was. He grew into a man of humility and courage who proclaimed the coming of the Lord. Jesus himself composed John's epitaph when he said on one occasion, no greater man has ever been born than John. That was John the Baptist. Humility, courage, and a commitment to bear witness to the light of God. May we also bear witness to that light. Amen. Great Creator, we are in awe of you. We will never know how you managed to dream up mountains and valleys, freckles, dimples, and curly hair, a cool morning mist, the change of the seasons, or the magic of music. Your greatness is beyond our reckoning. And because we are in awe of you, we believe we must follow Mary's lead and allow our souls to sing. We believe that the appropriate reaction to your goodness is complete gratitude, which looks like love for our neighbor, justice for the poor, food for the hungry, and joy that overflows. And even though we do not always believe in ourselves, we believe that our song is pleasing to you. We believe. Help our unbelief. In In Christ's Christ's name name we pray. pray. Amen.
Here are this week's joys and concerns. Cheryl S. and husband hospitalized with COVID. Maureen M. recovering from COVID. Mary Ann and Eileen E. Eileen is in the hospital with pneumonia. The Trinity Worship Team and Bell Choir as pre-recording of our worship services continues. Continued prayers for family and friends of Sherry Talasamia following Sherry's passing. EVS, who has been ill. Jeannie M., recovering from COVID. Pastor Deborah S. in Phoenix, thanksgiving for successful heart procedure. Prayers in remembrance of all those who served and all those who died at Pearl Harbor. Olivia Z., prayers for an accurate, treatable diagnosis. Jenny S., recuperating from cancer treatments. Jonna D., prayers for good iron levels. Robin, battling COVID. Gail I. in the ICU, battling pneumonia secondary to COVID. Ann T. for successful back surgery. Jim and Shirley T., Robert and Geraldine B., Clint and Patty W., and Neil F., travel mercies. Jamie H. and Alex B., recovering from severe injuries following a car accident. Family and friends of Kathy V., who died last week. Kathy Lynn C. V. and Abby, safe travels. Praise, Karen C. received word her recent scans were all clear. Mary Lou C., who is at home ill. Winnie M. and husband Bob, both home ill. Deltrina G. and two students as they await COVID test results. Laura Page D., returning to work in California following self-quarantine. Alan F., recovering from COVID, and Katie, John, and Michael awaiting test results. Richard W. and Chance, travel mercies. Joslyn P., prayers for a safe delivery for mom and baby. Prayers that we may all make safe, wise decisions this holiday. Continued prayers for all those impacted by COVID-19. In your love, Lord. Hear our prayers. If I wanted to sow joy, I wouldn't use words. I would turn the music all the way up and push the tables against the wall until we had room to dance. I would roll the windows down and drive you out of town until fresh air filled your lung. I would squeeze your hand and look you in the eye so that you would know you are not alone. I'd lay down the picnic basket and we'd look at the stars so that nothing could separate you from God's great beauty. I'd open my door like Elizabeth did to Mary. I'd tell you to stay as long as you'd like. Make yourself at home. What's mine is yours. And maybe we'd sing and maybe we'd laugh and maybe it would be enough to be in the presence of God and each other. If I wanted to sow joy, that's what I would do. So sing me your song. We've got dancing to get to. We pray now the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Holy One, this Advent season we wait in joy. And we give with joy. Joy for all you have given us. Joy because of your sacred promises. Receive these generous offerings and use them to spread your joy in our world. Amen.
would you receive now this benediction? Be people of joy. Let joy live in your heart and share the joy of Christ with all you meet. Share joy by seeing the good in each other. Share joy by remembering good times and hoping for more good times to come. Share joy by praying for our world. In this Advent season, we need to see, feel, and share joy. As you go into the wonder of God's creation, share joy, peace, and hope with all that you meet. Amen. We hope that you will join us next Sunday for the fourth Sunday of Advent as we continue our Advent series. In the meantime, wash your hands, wear a mask, and please stay safe. Join now in singing our closing hymn, Hark, the Herald Angels Sing. God bless.